This Impact Wrestling Review was brought to you by 5 Hour Energy. Try it, and Dixie Carter's next act as a heel will be sicking the censor board on ODB. I'm not sure what to make of this one. You would think, with Bound for Glory coming up in a few weeks, that the card would finally start coming together. And it is, albeit a little too slowly. But there's also a lot of stuff going on that, while it might be building to BFG in some way, I'll be damned if I can figure out how. And I think you know where I'm going with this, but first things first. <laughs> Oh, man. They, they just couldn't get the main event mafia out of this Aces of Eight storyline fast enough, could they? <laughs> In just two weeks, the mafia has shifted all their focus onto EGO. Forget that this faction was formed for the singular purpose of ridding TNA of the Aces of Eights. They don't care about that crap anymore, and it looks like the writers don't either. They obviously know that angle is a sinking ship, so they're like, fuck all this buildup. We're getting Sting, Joe, and Magnus into a more interesting feud with a more interesting group, so maybe, just maybe, they can have a match at Bound for Glory that the fans will actually give a shit about. And are you really complaining? Are you? Is anyone complaining about this? I'm not. Sure, it won't have much buildup, but that beats the hell out of a year and a half of buildup to a match I'd probably use as my piss break. M.E.M. EGO, BFG, book it. Yes! Anytime Impact starts with someone other than Hogan or the Aces of Eights, I'm likely to enjoy it. In this case, we got Magnus in Mick Foley mode going for the cheap pop and everything, challenging anyone in EGO to a match for costing him the win in the BFG series. They come out, Sting and Joe come out, brawl ensues, and then Sting channels his inner GM and he makes this match a tag team match! I guess I kind of jumped the gun using that one last week, huh? Damn it. What's interesting to me about this is that it's not really a faction war so much as it all stems from an issue that Magnus has with these guys. And Sting and Joe are essentially background players here. So, I think the purpose of this whole thing is to spotlight Magnus in some way. How exactly, I'm not sure. I could see it going a couple different directions, especially with the way the show ended. But this is so, so preferable to the Mafia getting stuck trying to carry West Nux and Garrett in a match that would have zero intrigue or suspense and probably wouldn't be that good. As a damage control feud to get the main event Mafia into some kind of interesting storyline for Bound for Glory, they could do a lot worse. I'll take it. So, would it be too cliché to say that the catchphrase is now Heal Sabin? Uh? 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 I'm sorry. That was lame. But I'll tell you what's not lame. Chris Sabin as an egotistical, self-entitled bad guy. He already looks more comfortable this way. And I can't believe some people are saying that this doesn't make sense. How? How does it not make sense? He feels like he got screwed out of the world title and gets no respect from the company. And he's really not that far off base. You can see where he's coming from here. The Aces of Eights cost him the title. He never got his rematch for it when even Bully Ray got a title rematch. And the second he loses it, it's like he's an afterthought all of a sudden. That would piss anyone off. You're telling me that's not justification enough to turn heel? Makes sense to me. Now, you have a point that most of the character shift here seemed to happen off-camera, which could be the reason for most of the confusion some people are having. I do wish we'd been privy to more of that. I mean, I still got it, but it wasn't stressed as much as it could have been, so I'll give you that one. Another problem this had was with the match. Manic versus Jeff Hardy. The match was fine, but it was too short. 
You know, the story was that Manic wanted to test himself against Hardy, but then Hardy beats him pretty quickly without much trouble. If he'd had a longer competitive match, then Saban attacking Manic afterward would have carried more weight. As it is, it felt like Saban attacking a guy who wasn't in Hardy's league, which then sort of extends to him too, and that probably wasn't the intention. Also, Saban being back in the X Division feels really redundant. What can he do there that he hasn't done? He's been the champion six times. And you've already got these other X guys that you're not doing a damn thing with. The whole angle with Bully Ray could have been used to elevate him if it had been handled better. Maybe the heel turn could have meant more if it had been saved for Bound for Glory. You know, he could have turned on someone higher on the card, but instead he's back with Manic again. So there was wasted potential there. But I do like where this is going in other ways. With this character change, I think Saban's promos have already gone from here to here, as we saw in that backstage pre-tape. But please, please tell me that Velvet Sky is going to turn heel with him. Velvet was so much better as a heel. And you got to figure that the horny male contingent is going to boo the shit out of this guy for taking Velvet Sky off the market. So why not just turn her heel too and really rub it in their fucking faces? <laughs> Seriously, do it. There's some big potential heat there. And yes, it would leave you with only one babyface knockout left, but to be brutally honest, I don't think that matters anymore. We had Mickey James versus ODB for the Knockouts Championship. ODB wins the title, which is awful. She's always been a horrible champion. And apparently, TNA couldn't come to terms on a new contract for Mickey, so she's gone now. And Mickey was the only knockout in a wrestling role they had left that was actually doing something interesting. She'd been a joy to watch with this new heel character, so this could not have come at a worse time. So there was a whole lot of stuff here that you'd think would really piss me off, but it didn't. I didn't care enough to get pissed off, that's the sad truth. There's no reason to get pissed off about another knockout leaving now because the damage has already been done. They've hit rock bottom. TNA's women's roster is the smallest it's been since before they had a women's division. There is absolutely zero interest here. It doesn't matter who the champion is anymore. Losing one more girl makes no difference now. And really, this is going to sound harsh, but at this point, I think the best thing you could possibly do for the knockouts is kill the division. Discontinue the championship, stop dragging this out, and just pull the plug on it. Then, when you finally signed enough female talent to make a real division again, you bring it back with a lot of hype and a new championship and a fresh roster and market it as like a new beginning, Knockouts 2.0 or something. I mean, sure, it would be weird for it to be gone for a while, but it's better than watching the division that used to mean so much die little by little week after week. I mean it, TNA. This is painful to watch, and I'm tired of it. This is how the world ends. Not with a bang but with a whimper. So ODB is celebrating with Eric Young and Joseph Park, and then the bromance came out. The ambiguously gay duo. And I thought for sure that this was going to be stupid as all hell, but then it somehow became amazing. Robbie starts talking shit, gets himself into a match with Eric, EY literally beats him in like 10 seconds, and then he challenges Joseph Park, and Joseph beats him even faster! <laughs> oh my god. This, this, this had to be a record of some kind, and it was fucking beautiful. Robbie has never looked like a bigger loser, and for him, that's saying something. So then the bromance try to lay them out, but Joseph gets his abyss on, and he takes out Robbie and Jesse two-on-one, so the bromance get fucked three times in a row. <laughs> I'm laughing at you. <laughs> <laughs> Damn right. Those morons didn't know who they were dealing with. Joseph Park is so fucking awesome, he eats lightning and craps thunder. You know, I should put that on the soundbite. In fact, I just did! <laughs> So needless to say, this was pretty awesome. 
It did seem awfully pointless, though. I mean, what did we learn here? Well, we learned that EY and Joseph make a formidable duo, Joseph is learning to channel the Abyss thing more effectively, and the Bromance are the biggest losers on Earth. Works for me, but where do we go from here? EY and Joseph challenging for the tag titles? I'd be okay with that. And hell, I'd take that in a second over the team that's challenging for him now. A part of me does kind of feel bad for Jesse Goddard's. I mean, he has an excuse for not being all that great yet. He's still a rookie, and he actually has shown improvement, so he seems to be trying to get better. But Robbie, you lazy, jobber piece of crap. This is exactly where you belong. I think the writing's on the wall for you, my dude. The game is over, and you lost. In other words, you ain't on the list, bro. Ha, ha, ha. Da, na, na, na. Your posterior better contact someone at once. So there's more dissension in the Aces of Eights because we haven't had enough of this yet. My God, it feels like this has been going on forever. Nobody cares about you guys. The Meat Shields are none too happy that Bully is thanking Tessmacher for his success instead of them. Well, can you blame him? Look at her. God damn. Anyway, they're fed up with him, they're mad as hell, and they're not gonna take it anymore. My question is, if they felt this way, why didn't they just turn on him last week when Anderson was there? I mean, really, the, the Tessmacher thing was the tipping point? That's silly. They're voicing their displeasure. Wes, thankfully, never even touches a microphone. I'll bet you anything that was no accident. To the shock of no one, Garrett is still a block of wood. But there was a legit surprise here. Nux. Freaking Nux actually cuts a pretty good promo about how they're not taking Bully's crap anymore. I was stunned. It wasn't amazing or anything, but he sure put Wes and Garrett to shame right there. And granted, they set the bar pretty low, but still. But then the worst thing that could possibly happen happens, and Bully Ray backs off like a coward. What the fuck? You want to dissolve the Aces of Eights? More power to you. You want Nux to break out? I don't think it'll work, but so be it. But it cannot. It cannot be at Bully Ray's expense. This is your top heel, world champion, he's main eventing your biggest show of the year, he already has a lack of momentum because this never-ending, godforsaken angle has been dragging him down with it, and now you have him run like a little girl from three scrubs who have meant absolutely nothing, nothing, in this entire storyline. You people are fools! What's wrong with this picture? This is not going to sell any pay-per-views, TNA, and you should know that. Bully should have stood up to these guys and torn them apart. He needs to look like a ruthless monster, and he did last week. But you just made him look like a giant pussy. And just like that, you just sucked any heat there might have been out of your BFG main event. Not good. Not good. Every time Chavo Guerrero tries to act like a badass, I don't know whether to laugh or cry. This guy is not believable in any way. He comes off like a punk who's putting on an act just to cover the fact that he's way higher on the card than he should be. He's trying to act all big and bad. It's hilariously awkward. No one's buying it. They do Gunner versus Hernandez. Gunner wins clean. Thank you. Can we please end this feud now before it goes any further? The tag team champions need some kind of interesting feud for Bound for Glory, and Los Stereotypicos ain't it. But don't boo me. You should be booing yourselves. Then we get our six-man tag match with the main event Mafia versus EGO. Pretty decent stuff here, but it's obvious they were holding back, so I'm sure we'll see this again. Can't wait for that. Rude gets Sting's bat, and Magnus acts as a human shield, taking the shot for Sting, and then he gets pinned himself. And that was interesting, because Sting has been the guy who's been giving Magnus all these pep talks, trying to build him up recently. And then this happens. And there was more going on here than just losing the match, clearly. The announcers were playing up that Magnus is in some kind of slump now, which he really isn't, but whatever. It could be the start of tension within the group, maybe with Magnus starting to resent Sting, perhaps? And a little interpersonal conflict is good. 
This is why EGO were such better opponents for the main event mafia. They look dangerous here. And no one would have ever believed for a second that Wes, Nux, and Garrett could fuck with the mafia like this. This is much better. This AJ Styles Dixie Carter angle. I didn't know what to make of it on paper. And having seen it now, I'm still not sure. But unless I'm way off base here, these writers have just done what even Vince Russo never had the balls to do. Taking that smarten up Dixie meme and turning it into a storyline. Say what? AJ is nailing Dixie to the wall here. You don't know how to run a wrestling company, your daddy's money pays for everything, you hire all these MMA guys and drive away people who help build the company like Alex Shelley, Jay Lethal, you sold out the X Division for overpaid veterans who didn't do shit. All this stuff the internet smart marks have been bitching about for years. I, I, I can't believe they actually went there. He got this crowd to completely turn on Dixie Carter, but then when she comes out, this thing gets even crazier. Dixie basically turns heel and calls AJ out on all the stuff the fans on the other end of the spectrum say about him. You're not a real star. You're not a draw. When's the last time you had a five-star match? The phenomenal one is just a marketing gimmick that I created. Holy shit. Because TNA is thought of as a family company, you always got the sense over the years that there were certain roads they just wouldn't go down. Certain sensitive topics they wouldn't explore because it's a family company and family doesn't do that to each other. They don't open up wounds like that just for the sake of business. But suddenly, all of that went out the damn window and these two ripped each other to shreds. But they were both making good points that were hard to argue against, so you know where they're coming from, too. I... I'm shocked. The more I think about it, the more I like this. Because it's not more faction warfare, it's not another fucking invasion angle or takeover angle. This is actually something TNA has never done before. And there are so many possibilities that could come out of this. AJ Styles as the voice of the smart marks, representing the band that Dixie broke up. The new heelish Dixie Carter as the voice of the casual fans, representing the stars they go for. And just imagine the implications if the wrestlers start picking sides. There's so many things they could do with this. I mean, they might have Jeff Jarrett come back and side with AJ's guys, which would kind of fill me with dread. But it would make sense in this context, so I could tolerate it as long as he didn't wrestle. I mean, they could have the makings of a really fascinating Civil War type of angle if they expand on this. Am I reading too much into it? Eh, probably. But damn it, this was exciting. I'm really interested. There's a lot of potential here. However, while this was a really shocking development, it didn't really hype out for glory, did it? In fact, they pretty much ignored the BFG main event all night long. And it's like that match is the furthest thing from AJ and Bully's minds. And then you've got Dixie saying that AJ Styles really isn't as great as the company has always said he was. Okay, well, why should I buy your pay-per-view to see him win the world title then? It created a really huge angle with AJ and Dixie, but suddenly AJ Bully Ray is way in the back seat. Maybe they're downplaying it on purpose. Maybe they don't think that match on its own is going to get a lot of buys. And at this point, I don't disagree. AJ Bully Ray really didn't have any buzz because the Aces of Eights angle was months and months past the expiration date. But now that match has the new hook of how is Dixie Carter going to factor into this? She's going to have some kind of a role to play now. But what's that role going to be? You know, Now we've got some intrigue here. But the way they did it kind of made it look like they were shitting on the pay-per-view main event at the same time, and... It, uh, maybe this is to make us rally behind AJ more? I don't know. This feels like one of those stories where you don't really see what the end point is until you get there, which makes it hard to anticipate things when you don't know what to expect, and... There's a lot to think about here, guys. Very noteworthy show. I don't think I'd call it a good hype show. A lot of the Bound for Glory card is still a question mark, a lot of characters have no direction. It still seems like they're putting a lot of focus on the story and not enough on the end point. And with BFG so close, we should be able to see the end point by now. Aside from this AJ Dixie thing, this pay-per-view has no buzz whatsoever. Still, they've got something potentially really big in the works here. Hopefully it turns out better than the Aces of Eights angle did. That's all for now. See you next time.